Our gospel lesson today is from Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 through 46. Jesus is speaking. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. <coughs> then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. I have said it before, and I will say it again. You learn the darndest things on the Internet. This week, I learned that the church year contains a day I had never even heard of. Now, it coincides with today's observance of Christ the King Sunday. I knew about Christ the King Sunday, learned about it in seminary, as Andrew says, it's also known as Reign of Christ Sunday, and it's the day that celebrates Christ as ruler over all creation. So logically, it comes at the end of the church year. The church year has walked us through the life of Christ, and today is the culmination of the whole Christ story, the place where all God's work will lead, the return of Christ, the end of history, the final realization of the kingdom of God. You have heard and you will hear those themes in the liturgy that began and will end our worship today. But that's not what I learned on the Internet this week. The day I learned about through my diligent research is Stir Up Sunday. In England on this day, it is a tradition to stir up the special pudding that will be served on Christmas Day. This pudding needs to be made several weeks in advance of Christmas. I confirmed all this with Pat Dyer. I want you to know that. Um, the timeline fits very neatly with Christ the King Sunday, on which day the Anglican liturgy happens to offer the following prayer. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, I <clears throat> am very glad to have learned about the stirring of the pudding, which our British sister Pat confirms is indeed a wonderful tradition. But I am even gladder to learn that there is this prayer, asking God to stir up our wills. This is a prayer that would bless us and help us every day. The first prayer we might pray before we get out of bed in the morning, a prayer that might help us get out of bed in the morning. And as we approach the new church year on this Christ the King Sunday, 
We should be curious about what will stir up our wills and stir us to action in the year to come. And that is something to pray about. To stir our emotions is not hard. We are emotional beings. We are created to feel. But to stir up our wills so that we move from feeling to action is harder. Yet every time our emotions are stirred, we have a choice of whether to move from feeling to action. And today's gospel story, I believe, is a meditation on that choice and its consequences. Matthew's Jesus has been building up to this story. For a couple of chapters now, he's been pointing his listeners ahead toward the end of the age. He forecasts an indeterminate period of waiting. And then he tells a series of stories in which someone is waiting for a person in power to show up. Servants wait for a master. Bridesmaids wait for a bridegroom. The stories center on what these characters are doing while they wait. Our attention is drawn to the choices that they make. And at the end of this series of stories comes today's text where it turns out that the choices have eternal consequences. There sits the Son of Man on his throne, and there gathered before him all the world's people. And it turns out that every person present has had opportunities, probably every day, to be stirred in some way by the plight of another. Everyone has met someone hungry or thirsty, exposed or stranger or sick or imprisoned, Every person standing there before the Son of Man has had at least one encounter with someone who is suffering. Now, because we are emotional beings created to feel, it is likely that everyone has been emotionally stirred. And the thing about being stirred, it is uncomfortable. Chances are <clears throat> both the people on the king's right and the people on the king's left, sheep and goats, if you will, were made uncomfortable by their encounter with suffering. But what separated sheep from goats is that some people moved away from what made them uncomfortable, and some moved toward it. <coughs> what can happen when we move toward what makes us uncomfortable? To answer that question, it might be useful to look at a real-life example. A couple of weeks ago, the National Story Corps project aired a conversation between two men who both live in Santa Ana, California, who had become friends in an unusual way. One man, Brian, is an artist with a job and a home, and the other, Matt, is homeless. And most days, Brian would see Matt outside his apartment building. Brian was stirred by Matt's suffering, but it was months before Brian was stirred to action. And then one day, Brian walked up to Matt and nervously introduced himself. And one of the first things he did was apologize to Matt, saying, I am sorry for driving by you about 100 times and never saying hi. And as Matt remembers it, Brian asked him a lot of questions. He said, like, what I want to do <clears throat> with my life, things that are important to a person. Matt told Brian, I moved here from Kentucky to be a musician, and some things didn't work out. And then out of nowhere, Brian says, he just asked Matt, can I paint your portrait? It was an inspired request. Remember that the word inspired is connected to spirit. Well, Matt said yes, and after Brian painted the portrait, he decided to sell it and give the money to Matt. And Brian had all kinds of ideas about what Matt needed to do with that money, a hotel room, clothes, shoes, and Matt would say, well, that sounds nice, but I want to record a CD. And after Matt had said the same thing several times, Brian gave up on the clothes and shoes and got Matt some studio time. And the CD will be available on December 4th. Now, taking Brian and Matt as an example, 
One thing that can happen when we move toward what makes us uncomfortable is that someone's suffering will be addressed. Matt appreciated what Brian did. He also said in their recorded conversation that the relationship with Brian was important to him. It's really helped me a lot, he said, to meet someone who's really stuck with me. Another thing that happened in this example was that Brian learned the importance of really listening. Imagine that Brian and Matt are characters in today's parable. What Matt might say to Brian is, I was hungry, but something was even more important to me than food. I had something to say, and you listened to me. Considering that what we do for the suffering members of God's family, we do for Jesus, we must conclude that when we listen to the suffering, really listen, we are listening to Jesus too. Maybe like any suffering person, what Jesus really wants is to be listened to. When we move toward what makes us uncomfortable, we also make ourselves vulnerable. We take a risk. We risk being wrong and even embarrassed. Like Brian, we may learn that our assumptions about how to help someone are mistaken. And we also risk discovering that we too are needy. Brian learned that he needed some things that Matt could give to him. For example, during his studio work, Matt refused to accept synthesized drums. And from that refusal, Brian learned authenticity. I thought to myself, he said, man, how many areas in my own life have I just maybe given in to settling for less? And the fact that Matt wouldn't, says Brian, was a lesson that I've taken with me from that day. And Brian told Matt what else he'd learned. He said, you've shown me things may not always be what they seem and that there's a new way of looking at the world and everyone deserves to be seen with eyes of love. Now this is rich fruit, and frankly it hangs very high up in the tree. Moving toward what makes us uncomfortable is a hard thing to do. It does not come naturally. And that is what is so hard about Christ's call. It requires us to live in ways that sometimes feel unnatural. Christ wants us to live as though we're already in that world that Isaiah predicts where the wolf lives with the lamb and the lion eats straw like the ox and the whole natural order of conflict and violence is turned upside down into a kingdom of peace. It's hard to live that way. It's so hard that we need God to stir up our will to do it. Maybe the people in today's parable, the ones on the king's right hand, maybe they had spent their lives praying, stir up, O God, the will of this faithful person. Even though it is scary, stir up my will so that I can move toward what makes me uncomfortable. Stir up my will to be present with others. Stir up my will to be vulnerable to others so may I be part of the culmination of Christ's great story. So may this faithful person participate in the salvation of the whole world. The late Anglican cleric Peter Toon said that today's prayer to stir up the wills sums up a major theme of all the prayers from the church year just past. This theme, he said, may be simply stated. In the Christian life, Unless the human will is engaged, then all thought and feeling may be wasted. What will happen when we pray for our wills to be stirred? How much closer in the coming year will we move toward what makes us uncomfortable? As as we reflect on today's parable and on the story of Brian and Matt, it is inspiring to know that in less than one week, the nonprofit group City with Dwellings will once again open our network of overflow shelters for the homeless. Now, a homeless person is likely to be hungry, thirsty, in need of clothing, in need of welcome, maybe sick 
and possibly a former prison inmate. Volunteering in the shelter offers us a chance to encounter any and all of the kinds of suffering mentioned in today's parable. Volunteering is therefore a particularly promising opportunity to move toward what makes us uncomfortable. If you've never heard of City with Dwellings or the shelters, you can take one step toward them by reading the City with Dwellings website or by picking up a flyer from one of the vestibules as you leave today. Maybe you'll decide that you'd like to cook a dinner for the shelter. If you've already cooked a dinner, maybe you'll take a step closer this year. You could work a couple of hours in the early evening as a check-in volunteer. If you've already worked as a check-in volunteer, maybe you are ready to try your first overnight shift. If you need someone by your side to do that, we can find an experienced home church volunteer to serve with you. Sister Ann Radford up there in the balcony, for one, has already told me she is happy to be that volunteer. You do get to sleep for half of the shift, if that's helpful to know. Give it some thought when you go home today. Think about other ways to move toward what makes you uncomfortable. Give it some thought while you're stirring up a Christmas pudding. Another thing I learned about Stir Up Sunday is that it is a whole family project because no one can stir that pudding alone. Your arm would get too tired. Everyone has to take a turn. We can stir things up together. May we pray together the prayer for Stir Up Sunday. Please repeat after me as we pray. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.